From the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, this is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. I'm Joy Baird. I'm Holly Baird. Coming up on the program. We're going to have things that we're going to change to do in our garden this year for best success. Your questions, our answers. And Mike Novot with the Environment Report. Scott Poirier with GottaGrowIt.com will be with us. And a whole lot more. Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast is permeating into your ears with your host, Joey Bear. And it could be the weeds. Some gardeners try to get all the weeds out of their garden. Other gardeners leave them in their garden. It's really a decision that you need to make. There's benefits to both sides of that. It's just something that you need to figure out what you want to do for your garden. And Holly Bear. Canning is a science. When you're canning, you want to make sure you follow the directions, follow the recipe, don't cut corners. Don't replace things. It's crucial to you, your health, and your family. They're professional gardeners with full-time jobs. And they're on the air now. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. A podcast for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide. Coming to you behind the TWBG microphone here in southeast Wisconsin, the information you're going to hear in this podcast is crucial and vital to the importance and success of your garden. You just may have to tweak some of the dates and times you applied for for your particular growing zone. Beside me is my wife, best friend, co-host, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. If you're tuning in for the very first time, we thank you. This is episode three for 2016. You can find all previous episodes at our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, underneath that podcast tab at the top of the page, you can see everything that we've done last year, the host, the topics, and a lot, a lot of great information. If you're tuning in for the very first time and you have no clue who we are and you just stumbled upon us, thank you. And we're going to tell you a little bit about who we are, what we do, and then we'll get into changes we're doing in our garden this year for success. So on our website, you will find our high quality, high edited. Great videos. We have uh, several a week that we put out. And then we also have our quarterly digital magazine. That's a free full-color magazine that we put out every three months. And it's got some great articles and all sorts of fun stuff. And then we also have this podcast. Yeah, the uh, publication for the pod, uh, for all everything that uh, we talk about is free on the website. We're doing about seven videos now a week. Uh, we'll do about 200 this year, kind of on pace for that. It seems like a lot. It is a lot. But there's a lot of information that needs to be uh, presented and available to you, the gardener, so you can have success, too, in your growings on your garden. So let's talk about some of the, well, our main topic. Let's talk about the things that we are doing different in our garden for success. Now, as gardeners, no matter where we're at, whether we're in, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Seattle, Washington, or or Sydney, Australia, we all do things in our garden thinking that they will be successful. Obviously, why would we otherwise garden if we didn't go in with the expectation that what we're going to do is going to be successful? Right. And so, you know, sometimes you try stuff, sometimes you aren't so successful. So, As, and, and when you're not successful, it's disappointing, but... You should learn from it, as we have taught, been taught from a very young age. Don't continually doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. What is that the definition of Insan- insanity. insanity? So, with that being said, there's things that we, uh, you know, we're in our sixth year, going into our sixth year of hardcore videographer, videography, and gardening, and website, and hardcore. all that hardcore. Hardcore. Uh, yeah, hardcore. So we have learned some things through the years, as well as seen some things that has not worked very well. And we like to bring this information to you, so you, if you're in your first year or second year or next year or this year will be, you know, you know, you're kind of getting into it. You'll know some of the things to do and what not to do, so you're not wasting valuable time on your property in your garden or of any shape, size, or form, so you can be successful. So some of the things that have not worked for us that we will not do anymore are... Uh, try to grow broccoli and cauliflower. And you take a look at this, and yes, in the front yard garden here, we were able to bro- grow broccoli one year by accident, one head. Sister-in-law's, your sister's backyard, she was able to grow cauliflower last year mm-hmm. for whatever reason. 
But you got to look at the what you get out of it if you are even successful. And you can you, know, you can go to the farmers market and get what a head of cauliflower, head of cabbage, uh, uh, broccoli for a dollar. Dollar two dollars. Dollar two dollars, and you're taking up two to three square feet of real estate for one head of cauliflower, one head of broccoli. Now, true enough, on the broccoli, you can utilize the stalk for for uh, broccoli slaw. It's the same concept. You shred the stalk and you can use it as slaw uh, to utilize much of the whole plant. But we can't grow it. Uh, or grow it very successfully, and it takes up a lot of real estate, or we could put a tomato plant in it and guarantee ourselves 20, 25, 30 pounds of tomatoes off of that particular plant versus one two-and-a-half-pound head of broccoli or cauliflower. Besides the fact that we don't really eat a ton of it. Right. So We find more use in the tomatoes than we do. I mean, not that we don't like it or anything. It's just that we can can the tomatoes, we can make pasta sauce, we can make tomato soup. We can make salsa, we can make all sorts of stuff with the tomatoes as opposed to, you know, the cauliflower. One of the biggest changes that you will see if you follow us on our video, video series, the uh, on all of them, will be we are introducing an irrigation system into the large garden. Now, this is, uh, you know, courtesy of Mr. Landscaper. Uh, they are an irrigation system. And the nice thing about, and we're not per, we're not telling you to go out and buy them, uh, there is a tab on our website that allows you to find more information out about them, but their product is made in the United States. Mm-hmm. Okay? So that's one thing that we have looked at. Now, we have rain barrels, but also we have, you know, at the big garden, we have about 1,700 square feet. And we have seen in years past where lack of water had greatly impacted the success of certain vegetables. Right. So we're going to work with the irrigation system and tweak it. Obviously, we're not going to get it 100% right this year. We know that. But it's going to greatly increase the yield that our garden will produce because of the uh, amount of water that we're going to be putting on it. Now, obviously, if you have never worked with an irrigation system, one of the key, and and this is part of the irrigation system is a drip system. Mm -hmm. Part of the irrigation system is a spraying Sprinkler sprinkler system above ground. One thing you need to know is just more water is not always better, okay? You have to be conscious of how much water you're putting on the garden, how much it's dripping, how much you're spraying on the garden, and how often you are. Because tomatoes will grow, peppers will grow, fill-in-the-blank will grow, but if they have too much water, you're just as worse off as you are if you didn't have enough water to begin with. So that's one of the changes we'll be making. Now, we also have plenty of leaves on the garden. Mm Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of leaves on our garden um, at the big garden, and so we, that's not really changed, but we're going to No, do but we intensified the amount of leaves that we put on the garden last year versus years that's previous. That's true, yeah. Uh, last year, and then the, so far this year, we've put 29 40-gallon trash can full of leaves on the garden. Half of those trash can fulls of leaves were mulched, so that would be the equivalent of a mulched 40-gallon trash can of leaves is the equivalent of two unmulched. 40 gallon yeah, trash can. Give or take. Give or take. Now, the reason why we do this is because we cover the soil. Covering the soil greatly enhances the life in the soil. It doesn't get weathered. If you look at nature, there's not very many places in nature, untouched by man, that is exposed to the environment, ex- uh, the air, the sunlight, uh, with the exception of a desert. Right. Now, with these leaves, we had put it at the time, you know, in some places it was a foot and a half, real close to two foot in some areas, and has com- it has broke down and, and diminished in size by about 75%. Yeah. But they are so full of life. There are so many le- worms in these leaves, you just brush back and you can see in some of these beds we incorporate a lot of coffee grounds in it too, but there's so much, uh, and this is one of the reasons why we never till. We've never tilled. Even when we started the project at the large garden and any of the gardens that we work on, we, yeah. we spaded. We, we just went in there with a shovel, flipped everything over, and we've never rented, used a tiller whatsoever. We yeah. thought about it. We started slow, though. We started with one section, and then we kept 900 adding. square feet, and then 1,100 square feet, yeah. and, which, which 900 square feet is not small to, no. s- to, some, to some people. No, but we just kind of putzed at it and worked our way in some more and more. But yeah, so that's one thing. And then now at the at our front yard garden, our house garden here, we're putting the pine. Pine straw, pine needles from mm-hmm. the pine trees that we have near the house. 
Now, I know what you're saying. Oh, whoa, wait, wait. That's going to make the soil extremely acidic. That wa- That is a garden myth. If you follow YouTuber uh, Stephen from albertaurbangarden.ca, he does a garden myth segment. Now, not every, and he does it science-based. Now, not everything that he does I agree with, even though it's science-based. But this is one that I he did a science based and and found that it doesn't make the soil acidic. Soil has what is called a compa- uh, a buffering capacity, and that uh, and Peon Smith also uses pine needles in some of his gardens as well. But it, it is a great deterrent of water uh, evaporation mm-hmm. because if you look and you put four or five inches of pine needles on a garden bed. It, it holds in. It's very thick, very dense, and it won't break down over a year or two. It'll take a very long time to break down those pine needles and turn into a soil. But anyway, that's the reason. And it looks very nice, and it's going to w- really repel the weeds. Uh, much better than it would leaves, because leaves over a three- or four-month or a summer period, most of them completely vanish because they've broke down in the soil. They've been uh, biodegraded. Needles will, the pine needles will take much longer. And you can actually go online and order bales of pine needles and have them shipped to your house from out west, which is not the most sustainable form of environmentalist that you can possibly do, but that's something, you know, but it will work very well. Uh, things we're avoiding this year, we're not growing sweet potatoes. Real quick before we go to the break, sweet potatoes we're not growing. What else are we uh, uh, not growing here? Uh, we're going to fight the rabbits. Mm-hmm. We're, we're already got a battle on that. We're, we're getting that taken care of. We're uh, going to grow more beans and more p- tomatoes, and we're going to reevaluate how we plant our potatoes for yeah. better success. And uh, is there anything else that we're missing? That uh, I think that's pretty uh, much. We, oh, the mupu tea. The mupu tea. We have our, one of our rain barrels. We elevated it. We're going to feed our plants about once a week, we well, th- or uh, once a month, once or twice a month. Yeah, once or twice a month. So we got it's a soil conditioner. Yeah, it's a soil conditioner, and it's good. Uh, no, you don't need any air stones or anything weird to. Make it, and it's great for your garden. It's organic. It's not anything bad, and uh, it's easy brew. And we're gonna do that. We're gonna put one with one of our rain barrels. Now, you were. Th- you, I know some of you are thinking, well, why don't you just hook it up to your irrigation system? We could. Mm-hmm. We could do that. I've looked at a lot of reviews, and and it just got to the point where I was tired of reading reviews and how to hook it up. It can be done. There is some uh, plumbing work that need if you're going to do it right. If you're going to do it right, there is a uh, it, to me, for what it's worth, there's a considerable a considerable um, amount of piping plumbing that needs to be done in order for the back pressure to be right, in order for it to siphon into the irrigation system. And if there's a clog, it's the whole problem. For us, for in our situation, it's going to be much more cost effective and time savings by just putting the mupu tea in the rain barrel and then with the rain barrel being elevated and uh, us having you know watering cans, we can simply uh, 30, 15, 30 minutes water everything very nicely. Containers. In contain, yeah, uh, jugs, watering cans, and water everything very nicely, very quickly versus the pain and headache that could put, that can and most likely would go into trying to set up the siphon in order to get the compost, the soil conditioner to work through the lines of the irrigation system. Right. Uh, in addition, we are allowing the strawberry patch to expand larger than it has ever been. We started the strawberry patch back when we started the garden, which would have been uh, oh, it was about five years five ago. Years ago. We and started, it started a year after. Right. We started with about a 30 square foot area. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget how many. They're June bearing strawberries, which that was a mistake we made. We really should have went with ever bearing. Yeah. Because ever bearing will put berries on from spring to fall as long as the temperature doesn't exceed 78 degrees Fahrenheit. This is very popular in the northern portions of the United States and in Canada. But we have June bearing. And if you know anything about strawberries, if you don't watch them or control them, uh, or take care of them, they will spread by runners, uh, the daughter plants. So now the g- strawberry patch has virtually doubled in size. And last year we were able to harvest almost, well, we we were successfully 10 to 12 pounds of strawberries is what we were able to harvest off that patch. This year with the more plants, we should be able to get close to that 15 pound mark, which will greatly reduce the amount of strawberries that we would regularly go pick 
how to pick your own farm. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we... Or just more strawberries for us to eat. More strawberries for us to eat. So that's something that we are very happy and excited about. So with that being said, you know, we'll uh, go from there and see if those changes. There's more, but those are some of the changes that we have had in our... We'll be having in our garden for better success. Coming up after the break, Mike Nobach with the Environmental Report. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautiful. Beautifully with the Embrace. Available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. Looking for a fast-acting, non-toxic weed killer for your organic garden? One that works in cool and cloudy conditions as low as 40 degrees and is highly biodegradable with visible results in less than two hours? Then look no more. Avenger Weed Killer has it all and more. Made from oranges, Avenger is highly effective, easy to use, and has a pleasant citrus aroma. It is armory listed and approved for organic gardeners under the USDA's National Organic Program. Avenger Avenger Weed Killer is a choice for organic gardeners and homeowners who are looking for an effective, safe way to control unwanted weeds. Available in ready-to-use sprays and concentrate, ask your local lawn and garden supplier for Avenger Weed Killer. For more information and a list of suppliers, visit AvengerOrganics.com. Avenger Weed Killer, eco-friendly, deadly to weeds. It's all about the soil at ManureTea.com. With their grass-fed, antibiotic, and growth hormone-free cattle and horses, owner Annie Haven puts the quality in her premium soil conditioner. 100% 100% organic and natural, whether feeding your flowers or veggies, indoors or out, you can grow organically with confidence. To purchase authentic Haven brand manure tea, small orders or large, go to manuretea.com. Always free shipping. Now back to two gardeners that know a little bit about what burns in their mouth. And you don't want to use your, you know, organic mouthwash. You want to use something that's got the ethanol, the alcohol in it. The bad stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the stuff that'll burn if you leave it in the oil for too long. Sure, we're going to holly bear. Welcome back to the program. You want to go ahead and check out our sponsors under the podcast tab on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Dot com support them because they support us. Oh, it's time for the exciting portion of the show. I for some people, I guess some people like hearing us talk. Some people like the guests. I, I enjoy listening to Mike Novak. Talk. I enjoy uh, Mike Novak is uh, you'll he'll we're going to talk about uh, his environmental report. He's going to be talking about seed libraries as well as congratulations, Mike, on your new radio program in Chicago. And he's going to talk more about that momentarily. So now here is Mike Novak. And now to a man who's not afraid to tell you what you need to do to keep the planet he lives on clean. Food scraps out to your compost pile. Screw in a compact fluorescent light bulb. Turn on a window fan instead of an air conditioner. Low flow, baby. Shower heads and toilets. Take one napkin at Starbucks instead of six. Mike Novak. Welcome to another installment of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Environmental Report, or WIVGER, as, <laughs> as we call it. I'm your genial not genius, host Mike Novak. Today I want to talk about a subject that I covered on my own radio program, the Mike Novak Show, which you can hear live each Sunday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. Central Time on Q4 Radio, which streams at www.q4.org. That's spelled Q-U-E numeral 4 dot org. On demand, podcasts are available at MikeNovak.net, and you spell that M-I-K-E-N-O-W-A-K dot net. Pretty much everybody who has ever grown something has worked with seeds. After all, people have been saving seeds for about 10,000 years, give or take a millennium. And recently, institutions called seed libraries have sprung up about 500 of them worldwide. Many seed libraries are located in public libraries and community centers. Here's how they work, basically. 
One, check out seeds. Two, plant and grow them at home. Three, harvest your crops. Four, save seeds from a few plants. Five, donate saved seeds back to the seed library. So far, so good, right? That is until in June of 2014 when agriculture officials in Pennsylvania cracked down on the Joseph T. Simpson Public Library's seed library in the town of Mechanicsburg. Why? For violating state seed law. It's important to note that every state in the Union has a seed law. Those laws regulate seed packaging, labeling, marketing, and sales within a state. What that means is applying for permits and doing germination tests and creating specific seed containers and labels, among other things. And the laws generally don't distinguish between commercial sales of seed and the free sharing or donation of seeds. In fact, California and other states considered the word sell to mean exchange, barter, or trade. Rao. Understandably, those laws were meant to hold commercial seed producers to certain standards. They keep seed companies accountable, preventing unfair competition in the seed industry and protecting farmers whose livelihoods depend on access to quality seeds. And anybody who's ever gotten a mislabeled seed or found noxious weeds or invasive species in the mix knows how valuable those standards are. But according to the Sustainable Economies Law Center, or S-E-L-C, and I'm quoting here, in order to give out member-donated seeds, the Simpson Seed Library would have had to put around 400 seeds of each variety through impractical seed testing procedures in order to determine quality, germination rate, and so on. Not only that, but other states like Minnesota and Nebraska started to get into the act, which started to concern seed activists about the possibility that the 300 seed libraries in the United States would be regulated right out of existence. That's why the SELC began the Save Seed Sharing Campaign, teaming with Shareable, Richmond Grows, and groups like Seed Matters, Seed Savers Exchange, and Concerned Citizens. Their goal is to educate people about seed-sharing issues, support seed-sharing communities, and reform overzealous seed laws. Seed laws have successfully been revised in Minnesota and Nebraska, and reforms are being considered in a number of states, including California and my own state of Illinois. But it's hard work, and it takes an informed public. To find out more about this issue, you can go to theselc.org, that's T-H-E-S-E-L-C dot org, or go to legaliseseeds.org to sign a petition to the directors of all 50 U.S. State Departments of Agriculture. That's it for today. I hope you catch the Mike Novak Show on Q4 Radio, www.qenumeral4.org, or you can always link to my website, mikenovak.net. Go green or go home. So think about that. Seed libraries, uh, what you can do maybe to uh, encourage one in your area and or to save seeds to carry on for years to come. Well, it's time for question and answer, Holly. It's uh, your questions, our answers. If you have a question for the program, feel free to send it to us via our email system on our website at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. There's a big red button on the right hand side of the page that says question. Click on that and fill out the form. Now, if you don't want to do that, what's another way that they can contact us? You can do the question. You oh, your voice recording. Voice, yeah. Explain that. Okay, so basically. It's you don't have to call anything. You just you can use your phone or your computer. Obviously, I'll make sure your computer will hear your voice or whatever. So you just click the voice recording, and then you, it go it takes you to this thing, and then you hit start, and you can ask a question. Ask a question, and we can also incorporate that into the broadcast. And if you uh, don't want to do none of those, you can certainly find us on our Facebook page, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, and you can leave a question there. Twitter. 
Twitter. All of, our, all, of it, all of our social media is on our website. There. So let's talk. Uh, I've got a whole lot of questions, and we don't have a whole lot of time, so we're just going to get to three today. So let's see here. Let's talk about that one. Let's let's do question okay. one. Okay. So it says we moved into a house that had asparagus beds, but they are amongst a lot of weeds. What would you do to clean this up? Asper- moved into a house with asparag- asparagus beds. Well, first of all, very fortunate. Asparagus can take up to five, four to five years to get to in a mature state to where you can harvest. But once you get to that mature state, asparagus can stay in the garden 20, 30. I've even heard stories of 50 plus years. Asparagus can continue to come back very readily. And it will also kind of, you know, spread a little bit too with the, the roots. So he has uh, this individual has a lot of weeds in their patch. What can they do? Well, one is, yes, you can pull them. But if you don't pull them enough, you're going to leave roots in the ground. Mm-hmm. And they're going to regenerate. They're going to uh, propagate. Uh, another way could be uh, mulching, the, yeah. mulching the paths between the, the, the beds. And or putting a uh, wood chips, uh, I'm speaking of, a heavy... Uh, a heavy layer of wood chips or even uh, landscape fabric where the walk paths are, where the asparagus is not, where the rows are not, where you would normally walk. Mm -hmm. Suppress the weeds there so it's less that you have to try to control. Then you can also basically work your way through the asparagus bed, pulling the weeds and or mulching somewhat heavy uh, where the asparagus is to try to suppress the weeds. But ultimately the best uh, situation there is one, where the walk paths are, mulch it heavy, put some kind of cloth down, uh, smother out those weeds. Then all you have to deal with is actually where the asparagus is growing. And realistically, pulling them is kind of where you need to be. Now, once the asparagus gets to the point where it's done harvest, uh, done harvest for the year, you can mulch that heavier and then let the, um, the uh, top growth uh, grow up and uh, start regenerating some of the roots. Um, that's the best answer I can give you. I know people hate the answer of you're going to have to pull the weeds, but that's kind of where you're at. You've already been fortunate enough and blessed to have asparagus patch that's already in mature state. That's just some of your um, you're doing your due diligence in order to yeah. uh, have the asparagus. All right. Patch. So then, um, well, what's our next question here? What is the best way to use coffee grounds? Well, the best way to use coffee grounds is just to first get them. them. How do we get them? You got to get them. Okay. So first, you got to get them. You call your local coffee shop, your local uh, coffee roaster, whatever. You say, hey, can I get, if I bring in a bucket, will you fill it with grounds? And they say, yeah. And then you pick it up one to two days later. Don't leave it there for a long time. Uh, don't be rude. Make sure you, you just, you know, go get it. And then... Well, you, I w- and we would prefer to go to a local, not a national chain coffee shop. Well, that's just what we do. Right, because they seem to be... More friendly. They seem to understand the purpose of why you're picking coffee grounds Mm up. Now, on that note, recently there was a YouTube video and somebody was explaining how they obtain coffee grounds. Mm -hmm. Well, one of that individual's comments was they will go around to different coffee shops and see if they can take all the coffee grounds from that particular day. His suggestion was buy something from that coffee shop and then ask them. You may spend 12 or $15, but you're going to get 50, 60, 70 pounds of coffee grounds. Don't buy anything. These people are more than happy to give you the coffee grounds for free. Yeah, they're just, don't, no, trust me. They say thank you to me. I do occasionally, both of my parents and, and thoroughly, well, most people thoroughly enjoy coffee, but I... You don't make a purpose of everything. I don't time make a going, purpose, yeah. yeah. I, um, I do buy coffee as a gift for them for, you know, birthdays or Father's Day, Mother's Day, whatever. Um, from from whoever we're getting our coffee grounds from, just because I'm there anyway. But um, but yeah, so that's what you do. That's how you get the coffee grounds. Then you put them in your vehicle, and sometimes I buckle them in, which I think is kind of funny. And then you have uh, Instagram photographs of that yes. at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Dot com yeah. Instagram page? Uh, maybe. Okay. So the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, I think, is the Instagram page you can see those on. Anyway, so. Yeah, so then you then you toss them in your garden. And this uh, past weekend, our little nephew was having fun. Joey was putting the coffee grounds in the bed where we're putting them. And he in. thought it was basically a sandbox full of coffee grounds. And he like, laid down in it. And I wasn't his parent, so I was not obligated <laughs> to tell him no. His, well, he, his mother came around, and she was uh, 
dismayed, and I said he was already there, had nothing to do with it. <laughs> she wasn't dismayed. She knows he likes to get dirty. But okay, so we, you can broadcast them on your garden bed. Mm-hmm. You can also work them in the top inch or two inches or spade them into your garden. You can also put them in your compost. Right, but you only want about 20% of your total compost capacity to be coffee right. grounds. Coffee grounds is a nitrogen base. They have about 2% nitrogen, I think like 0. 0.0 potassium, 0.3, uh, uh, what's the other, uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphate. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they have 2% nitrogen for most. Most coffee grounds are a neutral base. Some are acidic, some are alkaline, as I spoke about in the first segment with the pine needles. Soil has a compa- uh, buffering capacity to where it's not going to affect the soil to the point where you're not going to be able to grow tomatoes or peppers. It's not going to shoot it one way or another. Most, 99% of the time, your coffee grounds are going to be a neutral base pH. Mm-hmm. What we do, uh, you can till them in. You really want, don't want to bury them. You want them to get them in the first two or three inches of soil. Tickle them in, as they say. What we do is take and put a, literally about you know, a quarter of an inch of coffee grounds with the filters on top of the soil, and then we mulch them, cover them with leaves. Put four, five, six inches of leaves on top of it. What that, what happens with that is two things. One, when it rains, it permeates through the leaves and actually works the coffee grounds into the soil. And two, before, after the rain, the worms come up, and since there's a covering of leaves, they feel that it's still they're still under soil or under protection, where they can use them coffee grounds and process them through their body and, you know, work them and digest them and actually allow the soil to break them down quicker. Right. So, I just had a thought about okay. coffee grounds. Okay. But, uh, you know, coffee grounds... Oh, fil- if, if you have the filters, most of the people, will, uh, coffee shops will give you the filters with it because they're not going to think about... They're just dumping to go. They're just dumping to go. Yeah. But that's not... Don't pull them out. Just they, those things break down so quickly, you won't even notice them within a, a month. All right, let's get to our last question. All right, so then we have... The for the show is... I have been gardening for many years. I have one 10 by 10 raised bed and two 4 by 4 bins along with many huge containers. However, the food produce is minuscule, small, or very few. Why? So, unfortunately, we don't know. We, you know, we don't have any pictures. We just have this question here. Okay, um, so basically so, she's saying she's got a couple of raised beds, a couple of containers... Been gardening a long time, and the produce that she grows, she doesn't feel is what it should be. Mm-hmm. It's not getting as large as it could potentially get, or what she feels should get, based on if you were growing it, let's say, in a traditional ground. Well, there's a lot of factors to this question, okay? It could be, are the plants getting adequate sunlight? Are the plants getting adequate moisture? Do you have good compost or good soil that you're putting in that that uh, those containers or those raised beds? Have you depleted the nutrients in the soil? Are you continually reusing that soil in the containers? How uh, does, It doesn't specify how large the containers are. Just the raised bed is 10 by 10, and the uh, other raised, be- uh, raised, be- raised bin- beds are 4 by 4 with many huge containers. So huge containers to one individual could be 5 gallons. Huge containers to me, 25, 30, 45 gallons. That's what my definition of a huge container is. With containers, and people have asked this, what do I do? Can I reuse the soil that I used last year in my container? Well, based on who you talk to, you're going to get an answer that is eventually going to agree with what you think. I'll give you what I think. I would remove at least half of the material in the container. Now, this is if the container is, let's, I'm going to put a number out, 15 gallons or small. After you get above 15 gallons, a 20 gallon, a 30 gallon, a 40 gallon, we're using 60 gallon grow bags, there's a lot of soil in those. And a plant's not necessarily going to deplete all that nutrients in a, in a container of that magnitude. If you're in a small container, a 2 gallon, a 5 gallon, a 7 gallon type of thing, removing half of the, half the bag, half the material in that grow bag or in that container and revitalizing it with new material, you're going to help, you're going to, you know, you're going to be better off. Mm-hmm. You could add fertilizer, an organic fertilizer base, to the container to enhance the success of the uh, plant that you're putting in there. Uh, now, again, 
I, there's so many variables here. It's hard to determine what may be or may, what may not be the factor of why the produce is not producing. Now, in a in a raised bed, a raised bed, it sh- if raised beds are the way I think raised beds are for many of us, they are just at boards around a, a, a square with soil in it, and they can contact the actual ground to where nutrients. Uh, micro, microorganisms and worms can go in and out of that raised bed as needed or as wanted. It's not just got a, like a wood bottom on it. It's not a box. Mm-hmm. So it, there's a lot of variables, and that's the best answer that I can give for that particular situation for why things aren't growing well. Another thing it could possibly be is the variety of uh, vegetables you're growing. You may be growing a variety of squash, a variety of tomatoes, a variety of fill-in-the-blank that really doesn't grow very well in your area. Watermelons do... We've never been very successful to grow watermelons. Mm-hmm. Uh, Luke from the MI Gardener channel, he was on the program a couple of weeks ago, has a terrible time trying to grow successful watermelon. He's in Michigan. So that's just one example. You may be growing something that does not fare well for your growing conditions. That can be another reason. So you want to look around and see what varieties of squash or peppers or tomatoes mm-hmm. do very well in your particular area. And by to, to find this, you can go to your local university extension office. They have all this data. They can greatly narrow down the selection of what you would want to put in your garden. Right. So with that being said, you got anything else on that one? Uh, so that's all the questions. That's all the questions we have time for this week. Next week... Our next next show, more questions. Again, if you have a question, don't hesitate to send it in. We will answer it in a personal email as well as we will answer it on the air. Coming up after the break, Scott Poirier from GottaGrowIt.com right after this. A gardener knows that the key to a good plant is its roots. With poor roots, the end result is not good. Conventional pots and trays cause roots to wrap around and become root-bound. Then you try to unwrap the roots at the time of planting, hoping not to break them. But never again with the Root Maker, a non-chemical innovation that naturally air prunes roots to create more vigorous roots. Never a root-bound plant again. Whether trees, flowers, or edibles, home gardener or commercial grower, more roots means healthier, more productive plants. To get your own, visit RootMaker.com. If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear, penetrating product called Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your bare, untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops, by spraying Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts. Internal Wood Stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatings.com. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala Kombucha makes your body This is Jeff Radke from the Lost Skills Podcast. You can listen to me at lostskillspodcast.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast with Holly and Joey Baird. Welcome back to the program, everybody. If you want to learn more about our sponsors, you can visit them at our website at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com on our podcast tab. Please go ahead and support them as they support us. So let's go to the TWVG hotline and bring in our next guest. He, let's head to New Hampshire. He is the founder of an exciting website entitled GottaGrowIt.com and host of a YouTube channel, Scott at Gotta Grow It. He takes us into his garden and shows us the techniques, tips, and tricks to help all of us grow a garden better, from seed starting to harvest to preserving what we've grown. Scott is crazy about anything you can grow out of the ground and exciting and energizing to watch. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, Scott. Well, hello. It's good to be uh, good to be on with you guys. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on, and thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us on the program. 
Now, a lot of people... My pleasure. Oh, thank you. A lot of people get into gardening different ways, um, whether it be their parents or a family member, uh, who knows. How did you get into gardening? Uh, well, you know, it, it really dates back to, uh, it would be in the mid in the mid 1980s That's a long time ago, but uh, in, the, in the 1980s, we, we actually got our first home. And uh, I've always loved, you know, things that uh, grow. Just, I've always been fascinated with it. Uh, but never had an opportunity, or at least didn't feel like I had an opportunity that I could, like, grow my own stuff. But I had a neighbor. We had just moved in, and I had a neighbor. I kind of peeked over her fence one day. We were only there a couple of weeks. I was just kind of being nosy and peeked over. Oh, my goodness, she had this gorgeous garden. And I thought, wow, I can do that. And so the very next uh, summer, or the next spring that came by, I went to, like, a local nursery, and I bought a beefsteak tomato plant. And I had, in my mind's eye, I was like, yes, I'm going to have, like, 50 beefsteak tomatoes and eat them all summer long, you know? And I took that thing, and I went to my backyard. I took the heel on my foot, and I just dug a hole. And I dropped that little plant in there, and I watered it every now and then, and I thought this was going to happen. Um, I basically got a cherry tomato plant, or, or a cherry tomato off that one plant. Uh, that was my first year. And that's when I decided I'm going to do something different. And I started asking questions of my neighbor, and it kind of took off from there. And I've been crazy about it ever since. Now, Scott, there's going to be there's people that watch your YouTube channel, watch our YouTube channel, watch other gardeners uh-huh. on on YouTube, and they they look at and, and these are gardeners who are, are starting to garden or or want to garden, and, and they say to themselves. I can't grow a lot of food because I don't have 500 or 1,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 square feet to, to grow in. What do you say to those individuals who are limited on space? Yeah, so, you know, and, and I've, I've had some neighbors in the past that have had similar things. Like, ah, you know, I don't really have a plot or I don't have enough room or whatever. Um, I'm a hands-on kind of guy. I've taken some of these folks, literally, I've gone out and picked out uh, – either some pots for them or have gone into their backyard and found a little spot. Even even like on a deck or on a porch, um, if you can get just a little bit of quality soil, you can you can basically grow just about anything. Obviously, you know, if you have more room to, to experiment with more stuff, that's always fun. But uh, uh, in fact, the people who are really new at gardening, I would encourage them to not be thinking about something big. It's easy to get overwhelmed with it. Start small. Uh, so I would probably talk your ear off in the next hour convincing them that, oh, no, you can absolutely grow with very limited space. You really can. So as we know, you have to build your soil so it can so it can feed you, and, or feed, you have to feed your plants so it can feed you. What are some of the ways you feed your soil or build your soil in your garden? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and, I, and, and that's something that uh, – uh, you know, a, a lot of folks are really not sure what to do uh, with their soil. First, l- let me tell you that uh, I would always recommend uh, it's always good to get a soil test. Um, otherwise, you're just guessing. And I just learned a long time ago. I mean, I've been gardening now, what, 27, 28 years. And, you know, I've been to the school of hard knocks. I've learned a lot of stuff. So it's good to get the test done. You don't have to do it every year. Probably cost mm-hmm. you, you know, 25, 30 bucks, uh, especially if you have a local extension school nearby or something like that. So it's really not all that expensive. It takes some of the guesswork out, at least in what you have in your soil. Uh, so I'm pretty good at doing a test in, in my own, uh, on my own land about every two to three years. Um, nothing's really that much out of whack because I'm, I'm, I'm very engaged with my soil. Um, to come back to the question, what I do, what, what, what is my routine every single year is all of my yard waste, typically leaves, pine needles, don't be afraid of pine needles. A lot of folks think, oh, if high acid, this and that. Pine needles are absolutely wonderful for the soil. Uh, in fact, most most of the plants that we would grow, not all, but most, uh, tend to like uh, a little bit more acid rather than less. And so uh, pine needles are very good to add into your uh, soil base as well. So there's not a leaf that makes it out of my yard. Uh, I gather every single one, and I roll them into, uh, into my soil. Um, but I also do a conditioning, and I've learned this. And everything I do is organic. Uh, and it takes a while to really, if, if you're patient enough, if you're working with a good size piece of land, it takes a while to bring that, that soil up. You can't do it in one year, but you can have very healthy practices that you can 
uh, you know, engage uh, to, to get that soil base to where it needs to be. Uh, so the first some additional things that I add to soil, and I do it every single year, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of these items. Um, one uh, product is actually called Azomite, which is basically an acronym uh, that means, let me see if I can remember this, so it's, it's, it's Azomite, A-Z-O-M-I-T-E. So the acronym is it's, uh, A to Z of Minerals and Trace Elements. This product is actually mined out of uh, Utah, and it has... Uh, 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 volcanic uh, ashes and uh, a lot of minerals, like 70 plus minerals that that are that are that's in this deposit. And it's not that your plants want necessarily every single one of those minerals, but the more that you can enrich your soil uh, with a broad span of minerals, those plants know what they're looking for. Um, and and I swear by the Azel, my stuff is just. Uh, changed how I do my garden. It helps with, I think, the flavor, with color of, of uh, your produce. Definitely it helps with insects because as these plants are, are able to absorb some of the minerals that they would like to be able to absorb, and a bug kind of tries to tap into a leaf or something, it doesn't like it, and these bugs move away. And i got to tell you, I have less bug issues now than, than I've ever had, uh, and I've had some issues with that. Um, Another thing that uh, is very um, important in what I add uh, to my soil every year is a product called Sulfur Mag. So it, it's uh, S-U-L hyphen P as in as in Peter P O hyphen and then Mag M A G, um, and this basically is basically a potash uh, product. Uh, if you were to look at the numbers on a fertilizer bag, you know you have those three numbers uh, that are on there. Those, those numbers are basically telling you the measurement of nitrogen would be the first number, the second number would be uh, phosphorus, and the third number would be potassium, which is essentially potash. Um, and sulfur mag is number 22 on the potash. It's very, very high, and it doesn't have any nitrogen. It's basically a, a deposit as well. It's like a, a salt uh, deposit. Uh, I add that in every year, and what, and what is in that potash are very high levels of magnesium. Uh, there's also sulfur in there, which is good for flavor and color. Uh, but that uh, that magnesium uh, is very, very important for photosynthesis. Uh, so you're you're aiding the plant and helping it heat itself by absorbing, you know, the sun. Um, so I use this stuff every year, um, and that's it's been uh, tremendous uh, in my garden. Um, and so those are, you know, some of the essential things that I do each year. Now you talked That's about. That's a mouthful. There, there's a lot there. So. Now you talked about the soil test. If people go over to gottagrowit.com, they they can sign up for your free ebook. You're not selling anything. You're just giving them information. Then there's some secret videos that you diligently has have worked on, and walk people through exactly what and how to go about taking a soil test. Yes, in fact, uh, I do have a video on that as well. I've got a bunch of videos, but yes, I have a video on that as well. Um, uh, and and the book that uh, I actually wrote this book uh, just less than two years ago, uh, and it, you know part of it is is that it is a step by step. I also think it's philosophical as well, really trying to encourage an individual to think about what, what what it really means to get out there and learn how to garden. And and, and there's value in having some step by step, but there's also value in keeping yourself open to what the garden can actually teach you itself about how things grow. And so I really talk about stuff like that as well. And my book is also video infused, so each chapter has a an intro with me on a video, just kind of walking people through what they're about to read in the next chapter. So it's a it's a pretty decent book, and it's absolutely free, so it's good. Let's talk about stuff you grow in your garden. As gardeners across the country, across the world, we all have at one point or another struggled with a particular fruit, vegetable, or tree. What have you struggled and have difficulty growing in your particular garden? So, you know, and um, so right now I'll talk I'll talk in the past tense because, you know, I, I got to tell you, this year, this year was, was an exceptional year. You know, each year, and even though I've been doing this for a long time, it's not like I've figured things. You know, each year there's always something new. And you guys are gardeners. You know exactly what I'm talking about. There's just, there's another, you know, like, oh, yeah, I could probably do that, you know. So this year was a, was a unique year for me where pretty much 
pretty much everything that I had in the soil did, did pretty well. Now, even last year, last year and for the past several years, I have just uh, suffered with trying to grow zucchini, summer squash, uh, cucumbers. I mean, I plant enough of them and I'm still going to get some pretty good produce. Um, but part of my desire in growing as well is I like to maximize. I mean, that, that's just part of the fun. I mean, I want to eat the food, but I want to get the most out of my soil. I want a, I want a, a plant to grow to its fullest potential. Um, and I've had these insects that a whole lot of other people have as well. Uh, squash bugs. Uh, and don't be fooled by the name squash as if meaning that you can squash it. They're very hard to squash, but it's because they like squash, I guess, is what it is. But the squash bugs are devastating um, to any kind of, you know, melon, cucumber, stuff, stuff like that, the zucchini, summer squash. Uh, and then there's the cucumber beetle, which really looks like a cool beetle. I mean, you know, you, you look at that beetle, it's small, it's yellow with these, with these black stripes on it. I mean, that beetle, if you were, like, in the bug world, you'd be like, that's a cool beetle, man. I mean, I'd hang out with that beetle. It just looks really, really cool. But I'll tell you what, you got to get rid of these things because they'll devastate uh, your cucumbers. Um, and so I've tried all kinds of things. Of course, I want to stay organic, so I don't want to bring all this junk into my garden. Uh, there have been times that I, I would selectively use a non-organic, and it always tore me up. I was like, man, there's got to be another way. And I tried everything that there was. But I'll tell you what, I have discovered row covers. Very, very easy to work with. The product is, is called Agribond. It's, a, it's a, basically a, a fabric. Very, very easy to use. Um, you can create these little wire um, hoops that you can put over your garden, and you can throw that stuff on there. And the thing is, with like zucchini, summer squash, cucumbers, they're all self-pollinators anyway. I mean, it's always good to get the bugs in there that help you along as well. But you can put the row covers on those and let the plants fill up that spot that the row cover is covering. When you finally pull that cover off, like what I did this past year, I pulled the covers off. I actually had zucchini already growing when I pulled the covers off. So I had mature plants thriving. I had I never even saw a squash bug, and I didn't see any cucumber beetle. Because they moved on, well, I guess they moved on to my neighbors. I bet my neighbors had a rough one this year. Cause <laughs> all the bugs that were that were in my area have moved on because they didn't think there was anything in my area. So that's, that's been a tremendous uh, help for me. So I've had issues with, with those particular uh, products and things like this past year, I figured it out. And I swear by these. Okay, so you try to can as much out of your garden as you can that can be canned safely. For somebody new to canning, yes. this can be a scary job as it was for me. Uh, what, what do you say yes. about that? So, and, I, and I'll tell you, I'm crazy on the canning thing. I can and preserve, you know, as much stuff as I can. In fact, you know, here we are in January. I'm actually still eating carrots from my garden, which I didn't have to can at this point. I've been able to keep them in a cool place, and uh, we just keep pulling on our carrots, and here we are in January. But I can a bunch of other stuff, things like peaches, tomatoes, corn, uh, also carrots, beets, things, and things like that, green beans, stuff like that. Um, if, if a person uh, scared by it, at least initially, they probably need to be because you don't want to just you don't want to just listen to anybody about how you might can. Uh, and canning is is kind of loose word because there are two kinds of canning techniques. You have a high pressure canning uh, that you can do things like green beans and, and your carrots and corn and things like that. Then you have what's called really a hot water bath canning. Uh, you can do peaches. Uh, and something like that, and you can do tomatoes and something like that, where you're not getting the high pressure uh, cooking, but there are there are certain techniques that you can use to make sure that you preserve that food and you don't get sick. So if you're a little nervous, it's probably good because you don't want to get sick. So my first recommendation would be is buy buy a canner, and coming with that canner, uh, uh, part of the purchase with a canner is going to be a, a manual that's going to go over all the temperatures that you need to know about how to really do this stuff safely. You don't want to mess around with this. You get botulism, and it's not a good thing. Uh, people die from it and get, you know, very, very sick. So it's a wonderful thing to do, but you really have to have good instruction uh, to make sure that you're doing it correctly. I hope I hope that makes sense. It does. Now, you spoke about some yeah. of the problems you had with the squash squash bugs. Do, what, do you have any problems with, 
larger four-legged creatures in your garden? And if so, how have you dealt with it? And have you found a, a surefire way of removing them without having to use, like, let's say, firearms to do such? Yeah. So, um, and, you know, some years sometimes are worse than others. You know, hunger hunger has a way of, of making, uh, you know, these animals do drastic things to try to get into your garden. Um, some of the first techniques, you know, that I've learned is to put up just enough, but then we go, uh, maybe I'll go next door. And it's not that I don't like my neighbors, but I'm just like, I'd rather them go next door <laughs> so I can keep the stuff in my garden. But um, I actually have, uh, over the last six or seven years, I've been fairly successful. Uh, every now and then I may get a raccoon in there, but I've been uh, fairly successful in keeping we, we have a lot of deer in our area, so the deer would really devastate things. I, I think I haven't had a deer in my garden in probably four or five years. So what, what I've done is really just a simple uh, technique. Um, I have a four-foot, you know, uh, wired fence that I just, I, I, take, I take it down every year. Um, and I've got, you know, maybe 1,800, 2,000 square foot garden. You know, so there's a lot of space there. But I'm able to wrap that garden with this, uh, with this wired fence. So I unroll it. I pound in these four-foot uh, green stakes into the ground. There are these metal stakes that you can bang into the ground. And so I just unravel this four-foot fence, and I close off my entire, you know, garden area. And then what I do on top of the, on top of those green um, posts that I bang into the ground, I put five-foot bamboo shoots. I tie them to the top. And all I do is I take twine. And then, and then I, about every foot and a half, I just, you know, create a line of twine that goes all the way around the garden. And I go, I get up on the ladder, and I go up as high as I can go. So I'm, I'm you know, eight, nine feet up. There's nothing, that, I mean, a deer's not going to clear that. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's been the primary thing that I've done the past several years. And um, I haven't had any, they can't get in the garden. Smaller things get in the garden, you know, like chipmunks and stuff like that. But I'm growing so much stuff that I don't even notice. If they Maybe every now and then I'll see something where a bite's picking on something, but uh, my goodness, the stuff I'm pulling out of my garden, it doesn't even, it doesn't even affect me. Well, thanks, Scott. A lot of great information for our listeners who want to venture over and check out your website, and uh, you also have a lot of information that you post uh, video-wise on your Facebook page. What's the best way and the, the address again for your website is? So the uh, for um, for Facebook, uh, yeah, I mean that's where I'm pumping. I am pumping a lot of videos, you know, there on Facebook for sure. Um, and so, were you asking what what the Facebook um, address would be? Yeah, or the website. Yeah, yeah. So 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 it would be Facebook.com, and then you can do the slash and just put in "gotta grow it." Um, or if you're just on Facebook, I think if you just type in "gotta grow it," it's, it's going to come up, and then you can go over there. Um, Facebook's been great. I've got uh, I've got quite a uh, quite a fan base over there. There's been a lot of good good activity. Uh, I, I post lots and lots of videos there. Um, there there more than anywhere else. Well, Scott, That's greatly great appreciate uh, the information provided for us today. We'll have all of those links in the show notes below for this episode. And thanks again, Scott, for being on the program. Absolutely, it's been great being with you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll be back right after this. At dollarseed.com, all of our seeds are only a dollar a pack. And we have online resources that teach you all about the rewarding hobby of growing your own plants, flowers, herbs, and vegetables. Imagine the joy you'll feel when your children actually help you harvest your first garden crop. Or the pride of knowing you'll never need a florist again. Visit dollarseed.com and grow a little magic of your own for just a dollar. DollarSeed.com. What could be healthier? Water is our most important resource. The key is to capture the rain that falls on your property. No need for bulky rain barrels that are hard to handle and just don't fit in. Rain Reserve has solved the problem for you. With their multi-sized and color cube-like units, a rain barrel that does not look like one. Capturing rain, easy, going unnoticed by passerbyers and blending into the surrounding. Construction so easy, even children can put it together. To get your Rain Reserve, visit rainreserve.com and use coupon code RAIN2016 to save 10% on total purchase. Hi, this is Chris Van Cleve, host of the Rose Chat Podcast. 
you can hear us at rosechatpodcast.com. But right now, we're going to talk vegetables, and you're listening to Joy and Holly Baird on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. Welcome back to the program. If you want to find out more information about the sponsors you've just heard in our entire sponsor lineup, you can find that information at our website, at the wisconsinvegetablegardener.com. We have a lot of stuff there, and you can find all those sponsors underneath the podcast tab, as well as the show notes for this particular episode. Well, we've got two more things to cover before we get out of here today. We thank you for tuning in, but let's get two more things. we got gardening in two minutes, as well as we're going to talk about yacons. Yacons are a vegetable that you may not be familiar with, but when we get done telling you about it, you will be. Gardening in Two Minutes is an audio production that Holly and I produce on a weekly basis for several uh, radio programs and a couple of podcasts. If you would like Gardening in Two Minutes on your particular program, contact us through the website. This Gardening in Two Minutes is all about herbs. And here is Gardening in Two Minutes. This is Gardening in Two Minutes. One item that many people may neglect or forget about growing in their garden containers or raised beds is herbs. Herbs are really easy to grow. Even if you don't have a huge garden, you can grow them in containers we grow them in containers year-round. We grow them in containers year-round ourselves in our kitchen. Um, some do better than others outdoors. But we have a basil plant. We have some sorrel. We've had rosemary. So there's a number of things you can grow. And what you get at the grocery store and what you pay at the grocery store is crazy. And the varieties are very, very limited. For example, basil, you can get in the traditional basil that we're all familiar with. You can also get basil in cinnamon, lime, lemon, as well as licorice. licorice. So it's, it actually tastes like the name it, it is. So there's a variety of different herbs out there. For example, there's chocolate mint. So there's a, a number of different herbs that are not necessarily available at the store, but you can certainly grow in your at your place, in your garden, inside, that pays for itself over and over again throughout the years. Now keep in mind, some of these herbs could possibly be invasive so you might want to do a little bit of research mint i know at times can be invasive so do a little bit of research before you plant them in the ground in case you don't want them taking over too much or if you want to start a little herb garden at least you kind of know what to expect these herbs can be grown in partial shade you don't need full sun and there are some techniques on how to get them to grow longer. Some herbs are perennials, which means they will come back year after year based on how cold your winters are. For more information on growing basil, our weekly video productions, as well as our free downloadable digital quarterly magazine, you can find all that information at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide. For Gardening in Two Minutes, I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. So herbs offer a massive variety of flavors, and they're not that hard to grow. And some of them come back year after year. I think many people forget about them when they when they're growing them. So let's talk about yacons before we uh, get out of here today. Uh, yacons are a new plant that we grew. Well, they're, yeah, they're new for us. They're new for us, and I, they're 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 kind of what Jerusalem artichokes were about five years ago. They're that new plant that more and more people are interested in growing, but really don't have a whole lot of information on. So, yacons are actually related to the daisy. Um, they're grown in typically in North and Central America. Um, they, they're a tuberous root, kind of similar to the Jerusalem artichoke, the sunchoke. But they appear but, in a sweet potato-like form. Yeah. They, they look like a sweet potato if you were digging them up and you had no clue what it was. So they say that it's similar to jicama, the taste. I would I would agree with that a little bit. Uh, maybe more... Ours were very small, ours so... Ours were very small, so we'll see what happens. But yeah, so they um, they also are known as the Peruvian ground apple. and Sunroot? Um, sunroot. Some people say, uh, uh, what's it called? A, a French potato or a, something like that. So yeah. Um, so they are... Also related to the sunflower. They are a warm weather plant. Now, uh, obviously in southeast and central Wisconsin where we have seen them grown successfully and we have grown them, I would say successfully, 
they can be done. They do not with with other root crops such as we were successful, but we also learned right. With other root crops like Jerusalem artichokes, you can leave them in the ground over winter, and you can harvest them through the winter months, assuming the ground's not ice frozen. Sun uh, yacons, you need to dig them up. Mm-hmm. Ya, uh, yacon, unless you live in the south, unless you live in the south where the ground doesn't freeze, right. yacons are regrown from rhizomes that are on the roots. When you dig them up at harvest, you will see the potato-like tubers, the sweet potato-like tubers or we'll just call them tubers, then you'll also see bumps on the root zone that are purple. Ours are purple. And those are the rhizomes. They look like giant warts on the root base. So you save those, and then you can regrow them the following year. We were fortunate enough to get ours through Nichols Garden Nursery up in Oregon. There is a link on the main page of the website for them. Uh, if you choose to to venture in, and I think that we are one of the few. I think we've got the most videos on YouTube about yacons. Yeah, I think we got five f- five or six videos on yacons, harvesting them, growing them, starting rhizomes, dividing rhizomes. Now, keep in mind, um, it's it's a lot of work. Now, it's a lot of work, and also we had to wrap them in plastic to get them to grow more because we had a cooler summer. We kind of insulated them with an open top. Basically, open-top greenhouse yeah. type of situation with a tomato cage. And they do get to be about six feet tall, so keep that in mind. If you are planting your garden, you want to get some yacons, don't, and you don't want them towards the front of your garden, you want to keep them towards the back. They do want full sun, that's for sure. They do obviously prefer that it, it stays warm. And um, so you got to keep that all in mind, that it's not just like planting some spinach or radishes, you know, just slap it in the ground. It does need some TLC. And they, it is very good for soil um, biology as well. Yeah. So with the, and they're not as starchy. No, and let's just kind of briefly go over the the time frame here. You plant them about the same time as you plant tomatoes, frost free, mm-hmm. warm temperatures. They will uh, grow until uh, first frost. That'll kill them off. If you're successful enough, you will get flowers on. We were not successful enough to get flowers, but we still had tubers on the on the actual plant. Right. And you can go to our website and type in Yacons. You can find all these videos, and you, there's a lot more detail than what we're going to cover here. We're just teasing you about and, and wetting your appetite about the Yacon. So once you harvest it, you can eat the... You don't have to cook them. You can cook them, mm-hmm. but you can eat them raw. A lot of people, like my brother-in-law, uses them in soups and... And stews and... It's a very popular yeah. plant in South America, yeah. where, which is where he's from. Yeah, he's from Colombia, South America. So um, so he's more familiar with it than we were. And then it's also... Um, I think they have different varieties, too. Um, so you harvest them. We harvest the, the tubers. And we did some research on how to store the rhizomes. And different people said put them in sand or put them in that, put them in that. But what we did was we took and got one gallon plastic planters, containers, Mm -hmm. put them in sand, kept the sand moist, just like you would if you raked your hand back at the beach and took the top two inches off. Not soaking. Not soaking, just damp. And we put them in the crisper bottom shelf of the refrigerator. Now, we did it in two different fashions. We did two roots. That's all we had. Did two roots and did that. Then we took one rhizome and cut it from the root and put it in a party cup and did the same procedure with it. Kept them in a very cool... Because if you don't keep them cool, they're going to think it's grow time again, and they're going to start putting on growth. Yeah. So we, we, every month we checked them to see if they were, you know, needed hydration, if they were, you know, uh, dry, or because the moisture would get sucked out of them from the refrigerator. So when you want to, and then when it was, you want to start, you want to pull them out, and you want to get them divided and planted two to three months before you're intending them putting them in the garden, which we have done. We pulled them out, and then we found that they were very, very dehydrated and shriveled up. So what we did three days before we made the video, and we talk about this in the video, we soaked them very heavily, and they plumped right back up. And then there actually there were some of the rhizomes that kind of had some green nubbins on it, like you would see sprouts on a mm-hmm. potato. So four days, three to four days before we filmed, before we decided to divide them, we put them, brought them out, Put them next to a heater, got them very warm, and within those three and four days, many sprouts begin to emerge off the rhizomes because it, it 
thought the plant thought it was time to start regrowing as it would in the spring in the soil. Right. So we took I, we ended up with and you can divide these like a potato is kind of what we have found out and they're very similar to potato in growth where if you divide it it will grow the sprout will grow produce roots and then it will eventually disconnect itself from the chunk that it had initially came from the 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 nutrients so i think we started out with 27 divisions yeah uh we kept we took a big you know a big rhizome that had four or five gnomes on it or or sprouts on it and we kept cutting and some of them we cut pretty tiny and yeah. i i i really was trying to play around with this so i could get the information to provide to you the listener and the viewer to so we knew what could be done and what can't be done so we divided them, and out of the 27, uh, I divided some more because we lost some. But we, all total, we had 30 that we started, and we've got 20 successful, no, 22 successful rhizomes right now that are very, very pretty, under the grow lights, doing fabulous. And some of these rhizomes have multiple growths on them because I wasn't going to divide them when the growth tips were so close to one another. So you can find all that in the... Uh, at our website, and we'll put a link in the show notes for uh, how, uh, for the growing them year-round, the whole deal on that. So if, if you've never grown yacons, it may be a vegetable you might want to play around with based on where you live and how much intensive, you know, how much work you want to put into it. It's well worth it when you, for us, it was well worth it that we were able to grow it, harvest it, successfully winter it, winterize it, bring it back, and get... Uh, what is it? We had two to start with, and now we've got 22. So I don't know. That's like a nine, twelve hundred percent return yeah. on investment type of thing. And, and you know, we'll have even more next year. You can't have more than one hundred percent, though. We can't have more. But if you start with two plants, you have, we had two two plants mm-hmm. last year. Mm-hmm. We've got twenty two now because we hold, saved the rise. Yeah, yeah. You always tell me that you can't give more. You can give more than one hundred percent. Well, we appreciate you giving us 100% listening to the podcast all the way through, downloading it, and sharing it with your friends. We appreciate you tuning in this week. For the audio that you've heard, it's courtesy of sfx.uk.co, two royalty-free and copyright-free websites, uh, and Audio Neutronics, copyright and royalty-free websites we use to help liven up the podcast. And then Ness, Ella, and Dollar C provided their own uh, audio. So until next time, we appreciate you listening. I'm Joy Baird. I'm Holly Baird. And we will see you in the garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide and distributed in association with WI Garden Media.